presence unless you crossed him. But Havlicek steals it. Havlicek stole the ball. Down goes Frazier. Down goes Frazier. Down goes Frazier. To small boys, he was the essence of manhood. To some adults, he was a child. Dubbed Jax by New York tabloids, he seemed to have walked off the cover of a superhero comic, a powerful but friendly presence, unless you crossed him or faced him from the mound. Then he would try to beat you with his mouth, his bat, or both. Here is the straw that stirred the drink, Mr. October, Reggie Jackson. Now listen to the ovation. For Reggie Jackson as he comes up to the plate. Reggie Jackson has seen two pitches in the strike zone tonight, two, and he's going to post in the seat. He did great things in great moments. You can draw a line from Ruth to Reggie. And, and from that line, you find another home run hitter in that line who was as colorful as he was. But buried deep inside him is a terribly lonely and insecure person. And, you know, maybe he would be the buffet at a psychiatrist convention and they'd be able to analyze it. I think there's a lot of psychological curiosity about Reggie Jackson's personality. This is a guy hungry for affection, hungry for attention. He probably is a very insecure, unhappy, and lonely human being. Only the about the three faces of Eve. Makes me think about the nine faces of Reggie. It's like those game shows where you've got six doors and there's six different things behind every door. And you don't know what's back there. It's like Reggie, he was like all those doors in one. He's a loner in some ways. He loves attention in some ways. He's a very complicated figure. We all have insecurities in life. It's nothing to be taken lightly, uh, that's for sure. And I think that's, uh, you don't have any insecurities. I don't believe that everyone has them. No insecurities? Whether you love him or not, and whether you hate him or not, he won. He'd always say, it's in the books. It's in the books, just look it up. Sports is about memory and it's about imagination. And, and who gave you more memories than this guy? Nobody did. When Reggie came to the plate, I don't care what the score of the game was, people stopped to watch Reggie Jackson. His striking was more exciting than most guys hitting home runs. And we're down to the last out for the Yankees. Yes, a tie run at second. Tie record, Blairs at first. Reggie Jackson is the bat. Tom Well, the kid against the veteran, the fastballer against the fastball. Baseball was just going along, going along, and then here comes a guy like Jackson, and uh, whether you loved him or hated him, they, he filled the stadiums. Whenever he came up, Yankee Stadium or in Kansas City, I mean, the fans got on the edge of their seat. It's fun to play against guys like that.
controversy, the better Reggie was. You saw that little red light in the TV camera come on, he performed. He would actually look up at a crowd of reporters, and if he thought he was going too fast for them to take notes, he would slow down. He would slow down because he didn't want you to miss a word. Was it Daryl Knowles who said there isn't enough mustard for that hot dog? <laughs> I think Reggie had a huge ego, but Reggie was good and he knew he was good. And he let you know that he knew he was good. There's always been hot dogs in baseball. What Reggie did was he made it okay to be a hot dog if you could back it up. He was kind of like the Muhammad Ali of baseball. Uh, he he would talk, but he would he'd live up to it. When you were away, what were the major thoughts that went through your head? The magnitude of me, the magnitude of the instance, and the magnitude of New York. Reggie was a hot dog. He was a candy bar. He was a straw that stirred the drink. <laughs> it was a lot of different things that nobody else was. When you and I talk off camera, um, I continue to express the frustrations of, gosh, why'd I do this interview? No one's going to know me anyway. What about me? Don't you want to know me? Acknowledge that I've persevered, I've sacrificed, I've shown some discipline, I've been a good role model to somebody, I've answered the call, God gave me my talent, I'm responding to that. Those are the real important things that I want to talk about. Not just this day of cake and ice cream that's going to be gone. He was born in Wincote, Pennsylvania on May 18, 1946, to Martinez and Clara Jackson. One of six children, Reggie experienced a strange form of maternal rejection at six years old. He tells the story when his parents broke up, the mother lined up the kids, and she said, you know, I'm taking you, you, and you, you're, you're staying with your father. She took other siblings, but didn't take him. And he ended up being with his father, and then pretty much raising himself. His childhood shaped who he was. Reggie was a hustler from a little teeny kid. He was determined, no matter what he set out to do, he was gonna do it or else. Tremendous confidence, uh, knew he had, I guess, I think the phrase he always says, God-given abilities. He was very aware of that and not ashamed to let anybody know that. In high school, Jackson achieved good grades and excelled in football and baseball. But in the social world of the predominantly white suburban town, Reggie was forced to play a careful game. I had white friends, although many of my white friends were not allowed to play with me, and so, uh, you know, I had to leave early and meet them other, other places and things of that nature. I dated a white girl in, in high school, and I had to meet her. A buddy of mine used to go pick her up. The only way around it was for me to go to the door and pick up the girl and pretend I was dating her, and we'd go out, and Reggie would be out in the car, and then I would take her home at night. I knew I was a colored kid. Uh, I knew I was different. I knew I was less than, uh, or at least thought of as, as less than. Jackson's social gamesmanship reflected how his father supplemented his income from the cleaning business. My dad was taking care of his family best he could. And, uh, you know, when things were slow in the dry cleaning, uh, uh, he sold uh, moonshine. My dad was a bootlegger. There was a still definitely on Greenwood Avenue in Wincote. Mr. Jackson had the cleaners there, and I sort of think that was a front for him making a few extra bucks. A neighbor used to call us on the phone when someone was coming, you know, like the police were coming or whatever have you, you know, a neighbor would call us and warn us, and then Joe, Reg, and Jim would have to break the still down. And I could not handle that. One day, I don't know what went wrong, but Reggie came to my house, and he was all upset. They took Mr. Jackson away, and he lived without his father for like six months. With his father still in prison, Jackson graduated from high school in 1964. Largely on the strength of his football talents, he was awarded a scholarship to Arizona State. That summer, the 18-year-old hit the road, bound for the Southwest. I didn't know where Arizona was. I'd never seen Arizona. Arizona to me was a desert. 
And I figured, gosh, you know, uh, and I'd go out there, and my father had insisted time and time again, get yourself a college education, get an education. It's something they can't ever take away from you. I'm sure there was a lot of people who were interested in him, both in football and baseball, but at that time, Arizona State was a premier baseball program, more so than football. So we convinced him that he could participate in both sports, and that's how we got him to come to Arizona State. He had a deal, as far as I knew, with Frank Cush, that if he made the baseball team as a sophomore, he wouldn't have to go to spring football. Baseball was easy, so hey, let me go out here, run around in shorts. Uh, Bobby Winkles, he's going to run me to death till my tongue hangs out. But, you know, I can handle that. I have to go out there in football and get my head banged in. Reggie was raw at the beginning of the fundamentals. He had only played first base and pitched back in high school. I knew he was going to be a great ball player when I played with him in college. Now, you know, could you predict he's going to be a Hall of Fame type ball player? No, but I can still remember some shots he hit in the California League. They might still be going. I was at USC when he was at Arizona State. He played big. Not only did he put big numbers up, but really when he was on the field, there was one guy on the field. All eyes on Reggie. Hitting 15 homers in 52 games as a sophomore, Jackson decided he was ready to turn pro and entered the 1966 draft. Reggie's year, he was drafted second. The number one pick was a catcher at Antelope Valley High School. Some Mets scout is probably still rattling off the walls on that one because the Mets had the first pick. With the Mets passing on Jackson, athletics owner Charlie Finley took up hot pursuit. Reggie Jackson came out with his father just before my dad signed him. My dad was recruiting him, and he and his father came out to the farm. I just saw this big man, and I knew he'd be a ball player on our team. My dad told Charlie Finley that I want you to pay for him to go back to school, and uh, I wanted the new car a 421 Pontiac with a four-speed. He called me and said, what shall I do? I said, tell him you want 75 or you're going home. He stood up, they thought, it's all over. Jackson stayed and eventually signed for $85,000. If veiled racism shadowed Reggie from childhood, it bared its face during his second season in the minors. I think that if Reggie had any doubts about what the country was like. Those were erased by his minor league experience. That even in the 1960s, it wasn't a hell of a lot different than the 1950s and 1940s, especially in the South. He goes to play for the A's farm team in Birmingham. He goes in to pump gas, and a guy yells the N-word at him, get out of here, and Reggie is terrified. Now, it's interesting because 10 years later, Reggie would have popped the guy one. <laughs> Reggie had never been exposed to southern prejudice of being a black man in the south you know he was raised up in, in philadelphia up in the north up there and he didn't have quite the, the outward hostility that he had to deal with down there many times the team uh, could not eat when we traveled that we had to have box lunches brought to us because of me and john mcnamara wouldn't allow the team to eat anywhere if i couldn't we left Birmingham after a ball game and we were going into Charlotte or someplace to play the next night. So we stopped at some place. We went to the counter and a big man behind the counter and he said, are you in charge of these people? And I said, yes. And he said, we'll feed these other people, but we're not feeding him. They couldn't even go out of there hotel room at night. It was so bad. The white guys, they could all go out, but the black players had to be very careful what they did. It was a very, to me, bleak type situation, being cut off from everybody. And so if they weren't at the ballpark, they really had no contact with the rest of the group. Every letter I got from him was, hi, I love you, how are you and your girls? Nothing nothing about the race. I didn't even know that. Jackson found relief from racism later that 1967 season when he was called up to the majors where a new set of difficulties awaited. In the summer of 1969, only eight years after Roger Maris broke Babe Ruth's home run record, 23-year-old Reggie Jackson was on pace to make history. 
Reggie Jackson of the Oakland Athletics, who at this point in time, with 27 home runs leading both major leagues, is three ahead of Roger Maris's pace, 15 ahead of the pace of Babe Ruth. Reggie had 37 home runs at the All-Star break. He was ahead of Ruth and Maris, and, uh, and he was the McGuire of his time. He tailed off. He was just a young guy. And he kind of wilted in the second half, finished with 47 homers. A monster year, nonetheless. In 1971, Jackson got a chance to perform on a national stage when he was a late addition to the All-Star team. I was selected to go to Detroit to substitute for Tony Oliva. And so when I left the Oakland clubhouse, Sal Bando had said to me, do me a favor, Buck, and don't embarrass us. Don't strike out. I went to the plate, and before you knew it, I was a ball and two strikes. And I got out of batter's box, and I, all I could hear was Bando in my ear. Don't strike out. Don't strike out. And so I kind of choked up a little bit, and Doc Ellis hung a slider. Here's the pitch. <laughs> It left his bat so quickly and got out of the ballpark. It, it was unbelievable. It hit the transformer on top of the roof in Detroit. I don't know where that be the ball hit any harder or as hard as that would it. That would have gone out at the airport. <laughs> I've never seen a ball hit so far and so high. And if it didn't hit the lights in right field, that ball would have been out of Detroit State. Jackson's home run not only won him a touch of national recognition, it gained him respect on a team in the pre-dawn of its rise into history. We were bred together, we were taught together, we were taught by one man, by a czar, if you will, or a dictator. It was a great club of personalities and characters and talent. And Jackson was the ringleader. I mean, he always said he stirred the pot, and he was the swizzle stick. Sal Bando and Reggie Jackson and Joe Rudy and Vida Blue and Charlie Finley somehow could be thrown into a room and argue and fight and carry on like kids in a frat house. And then when it was time to go out and play, play the most beautiful game of baseball you've ever seen. We had scuffles during World Series. We had scuffles during the regular season. But they all came out and played. And if you ever picked on an Oakland eight, you had to fight the whole team. Doesn't matter if they'd had a fight the day before between themselves. They fought and argued much more than we did. I mean, they looked at our little scraps as saying, we had that on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah. One of those days occurred in June of 1974. It began with words between Jackson and outfielder Billy North. They came to blows and, and battled, and that Reggie was naked at the time. North was uh, in his street clothes. It had nothing to do with baseball. I think it had to do with a girlfriend of some sort. And uh, they got it all straightened out. The only unfortunate thing is Ray Fossey, our catcher, tried to break it up, and he ended up um, slipping a disc in the back of his neck to it. We had guys come to our ball club late in the season from other teams. And they would be there for two or three days, and you'd say, well, how you like it? And you'd say, well, man, I expected to see blood in the clubhouse and fights. It was a great team that the media enjoyed. We had colorful uniforms, and everything around us added to that image of being different or singling ourselves out. And along with it all, we did the most important thing, and that was be champion. In 1972, Jackson's 25 homers helped drive the A's into the playoffs against the Tigers. Although Oakland won in five games, an injury forced Reggie to watch his teammates beat the Reds in the World Series. But the next year would belong to Jackson. He was the MVP in both the World Series and the regular season in 73, and his license plate, his personalized license plate, was 73 MVP. <laughs> Not that anybody didn't know it. In 1974, the A's joined the Yankees as the only teams in history to win three straight world championships. But the ride was all but over. With Catfish Hunter gone to the Yankees by 1975, Oakland lost in the playoffs. Next to go was Jackson. The worst day of my life was when they traded Reggie, who was a, my quote guy, and uh, Ken Holtzman, who was my bridge partner. Uh, they traded him on the same day to Baltimore. We were all shocked because he was such an important part of our ball club. He was a key to our ball club, and we're losing him. 
After 254 homers and 733 RBIs in nine seasons, Jackson left for Baltimore, feeling a familiar sting of rejection. I signed with the A's when I was 19. I was traded when I was, I think, 28 or 29. I'd never been anywhere else. It was a feeling of being cast aside. While baseball owners took their first baby steps into the minefield of free agency, Reggie Jackson, biding his time in a Baltimore Orioles uniform, stood waving on the horizon. The most dramatic thing that happened in the 70s was clearly free agency, allowing players to move from team to team as all Americans move from job to job. Suddenly, baseball players were independent entrepreneurs who stood out there and said, make me an offer. And that really did change the whole context of baseball as fans had known it ever since baseball began. In November of 1976, at New York's Plaza Hotel, Jackson was the center of attention in baseball's first free agent draft. I was the number one pick in the free agent draft. There were only seven or eight teams that drafted me that could, that could afford it. Reggie wanted a bigger arena. Uh, Baltimore, where he played for only one year, was a mere way station on his way to New York. Orioles still want him. Padres want him. George Steinbrenner wants him. So Steinbrenner calls me and says he wants to fly in. Can he get together with us? The description of Steinbrenner uh, hustling uh, Reggie Jackson to sign with the Yankees always became sort of a description of how a guy hustles a beautiful woman. George Steinbrenner was charming. They had just come off playing in the World Series. I knew they were a good club. And finally, Reggie agreed to sign, and both Reggie Jackson and George Steinbrenner dropped a few tears as they shook hands, and they knew this was the beginning of a great adventure. Everywhere he went, he delivered championships in Oakland, he did great for Baltimore, and he did it for me. And when he made his mind up to come with me, I appreciated that, and boy, did he deliver. I'm a Yankee because George Steinbrenner was hustling, man, and I, I don't, there's no other way to say it. Uh, and he expressed to me a man-on-man -man relationship, and uh, I feel like I'm a friend of his. I'm a ball player, and i got to do a job here. Reggie was a star. It's George collected stars. It wasn't so much what a great player he was. It was that he wanted people to put fannies in the seats. The So when George Steinbrenner signed Reggie Jackson for a huge, huge amount of money in 1976 for a baseball player, he really did wake up the country to the idea that these ball players are going to make movie star salaries. After signing a five-year contract with the Yankees for $3 million, Jackson was the highest paid player in history. I came there and one of the questions was, what do you think about becoming a star in New York? And I said, well, I'm not coming to New York to become a star. I'm bringing my star there. I've already been in for a World Series. One of the most valuable players were in the series and during the season. Like, what do you mean I'm going to become a star in New York? The real interesting thing about Reggie is for all his tremendous talent, he was a terribly, terribly insecure human being. He was a guy who was afraid when he came to the Yankees. He knew he was walking into a hornet's tent. Jackson lost whatever credibility he had with teammates when a quote attributed to him in Sport Magazine was deemed self-serving. They knew that Reggie had an ego, and the Yankees' initial reaction to Reggie when he came there was provoked by his, his quote of, I'm the straw that stirs the drink. The Yankees were finishing practice. I walked over to Reggie. I said, I'm Bob Ward from Sport Magazine. And he said, well, I don't know if I want to do this interview because I was burned by Sport Magazine once before. Is this going to be a favorable article or an unfavorable article? And I said, I'm here to set the record straight. He then unburdened himself with months of things. He can stir the drink. But I'm the straw that stirs the drink. He can stir, but he can only stir it bad. That I never said. I said something that was misinterpreted by Ward, that here was a team, I'm the final ingredient. They've got everything there in the mix. They need one more thing. The guy says to me, 
things. So you're, you're like the, 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 the stirrer. You're, you're the final thing. You're like the straw that stirs all that. Yeah, sure, sounds good. I never made the comment. After he said that, because I'm not a heartless guy, uh, I felt a little sorry for him. Because I thought this is going to cause him trouble. So I said, you want all this printed? And he took his big fist, I still remember it, and pounded the bar and said, print it! That was Ward's deal, and, you know, what was I going to say? He put quotes around it, and bang. The thing that annoyed those players was, before they had gotten to know him, here was this quote. He had said this before he was able to, to back it up. I walked into the clubhouse the day the magazine was first out, and, you know, Thurman was carrying his back pocket, and he realized that he was in trouble. You know, that, that just didn't set well with the guys that had been there for four or five or six years. I believe that Reggie said it largely because it was, he liked the way it sounded. It was a nice quote. He always gave you what you wanted. He was great at that. But it was the wrong time, and it was against the wrong guy because Thurman was beloved by his teammates and was really the leader in that clubhouse. It sounded so much like him that you couldn't imagine that anybody made it up. The furor over the magazine article further isolated Jackson from players who already resented his high salary. To make matters worse, he was playing for a manager who didn't want him and an owner who expected him to bring the Yankees their first championship in 15 seasons. The tumultuous nature of the relationship of Reggie Jackson, George Steinbrenner, and Billy Martin is that there was no room, no team, no state, no country big enough for all three of them at the same time. The bickering between Reggie and Steinbrenner, it was all just part of it. They were two huge, colossal egos, and they both wanted to be the big star of what was happening in New York. Certainly the relationship between Billy and Reggie was stormy, to put it mildly. You remember that incident at Fenway Park on TV, the game of the week, no less, on a Saturday afternoon, when uh, Reggie didn't hustle after a ball in the outfield, and Billy yanked him out of the game. Reggie has done that on several balls hit to right field. Billy is really upset. We really didn't know what was going on until we saw, you know, the commotion in the dugout because we were, we were still hitting. That may be the first time I've ever seen that happen in a dugout. Billy wants to get at Reggie, and I was being restrained by Yogi Berra and Elston Howard. The ball was hit to right field, and I watched Reggie, and Reggie came in and loafed on the ball. He didn't, he didn't hustle, and Martin sent out a replacement for him. You know, Reggie sort of looked like me, huh? When he sent in Paul Blair to take me out of the ball game, it never entered my mind that he was showing me up. It never entered my mind. And then people started talking about him. He showed you up, he showed, he showed you up. It didn't enter my mind until I got on the bench and he put on this big show of acting like he was going to fight me or challenge me or something. It was part of the sideshow that those Yankees were. It was like watching people tumble out of a Volkswagen at the circus. That was the Yankees. Through the dog days of August, the Yankees edged closer to a division title. But no one, not Steinbrenner, Martin, or the press, would be satisfied with anything less than total victory. With his multi-million dollar salary and his declaration in Sport Magazine, Jackson was on the line. He's on the verge of a nervous breakdown, a real one. He's black, he's in New York, a little guy that grew up in, in Philadelphia. And he, it isn't like this team isn't successful the year before. He's got to win. You don't come to New York to try hard, you come to New York to win. And so he's carrying all this on his shoulders. Jackson answered the challenge by finishing with 32 homers and 110 RBIs as New York reached the playoffs. After beating the Royals in five games, the Yankees flew like bickering eagles into the World Series, and Reggie would win his wings. ABC Sports presents the 1977 World Series. From 
Yankee Stadium in New York City. The sixth game between the Los Angeles Dodgers and the New York Yankees. With the Yankees up three games to two, Jackson swung his bat once in the fourth and again in the fifth and donated two mammoth homers. But he wasn't done yet. I had a feeling he'd do something real big that night. When you're in the zone like that and, and you're on center stage, uh, Reggie just kind of just, just pops out at you. It was one of those unforgettable baseball moments and uh, certainly a, an unforgettable moment in World Series history. what makes you a great performer other than that you're able to do it on the biggest stage and then boom hoot home run boom Elias Sosa home run boom huh and of course the third one was into the black seats the longest of them all this majestic soaring towering home run and it was like can you believe this guy did this that's That's good. Good. That's That's good. Good. They all tried to grab him after hitting the home runs. That zigzag, nobody could have tackled him. That was the football skills coming in. I'll never forget the moment where he hits the third home run and he goes around first base and Steve Garvey is applauding inside his glove like this. And I thought, that's what makes somebody larger than life. The press asked me afterwards, somebody said, did you applaud him in your glove? I said, I mean, if, if I had hit three in a game, I would... I would hope the opposition would say, that is special. And it was. Made me sick to my stomach. Devastating. I tell you, I was never so sick as I was that day in my life to see this guy hit three home runs out of the ballpark in one game in the World Series off of three different pitchers. I couldn't believe it, really. I looked at that day as finally being accepted as the reason why I had been brought to New York by George. I was a fan and a player and was both at the same time. All year, he had been the target. All the spotlight had been on him. He had had the blow up with Martin in Fenway in June. He had come to be the cleanup hitter at the insistence of Munson and Pinella going to Billy Martin. And he had come through like a champ. The ultimate fulfillment for a controversial he stood up that night and said, look at everything I've been through this year. Look at all the days where I sat on my terrace on 79th Street and didn't want to go to the ballpark. Look at everything I went through with the owner and with the manager. And who's still standing at the end? I am. Who just hit three out? I did. He told me uh, that that was the most difficult year he'd ever had in baseball. And that he knew he'd gotten off on the wrong foot and that he felt uh, this uh, deep resentment and that he knew his manager disliked him intensely and he felt he had to do something in the World Series to bring some order into the chaos that he basically had created for himself and of course he did. The World Series was almost kind of a human manhood character test from the opening day of the season right through the last game. The last game changed all of that. Jackson's words proved to be unfounded. Although he led the Yankees to their second straight world championship in 1978 with two homers and a 391 batting average, the team's poor chemistry did not improve. Many players pointed to Reggie's ongoing affair with the press. He struck me as the kind of guy that if everybody in the room knew his name except one guy, he would go over and tell that guy, I'm Reggie Jackson, don't you know who I am? Reggie Jackson was honey to the media bees because he was absolutely the most quotable guy that maybe ever lived in baseball. 
I was from the era of Ali. And uh, I could talk a little trash and a little smack and have fun with it. And the press played me, and I played them. I'm holding this press conference on my new Panasonic Omnivision home video recorder. Only Reggie. For the next six hours. Six hours? You'll see my greatest plays in slow motion. And Omnisearch lets you find your favorite part. Do you believe this? The end. Wait. Oh. I wish this wireless remote could control the press. I wrote a column about him when the Yankees were playing against the Orioles, and he saw the column that day. And I talked about um, Reggie's intellectual vanity, that he was really smart, but that he got carried away with pontificating about any subject under the sun. And I said that if Reggie Jackson talked about the Bill of Rights long enough, he'd make you want to repeal it. So I'm walking through the clubhouse that day, and here comes Reggie. And he's got my column folded over, and he's tapping it with his fingers. And I come over and he says, points to the paragraph, he says, so true, so true. He was the best player I ever saw to use television cameras. No question in my mind. We had gone in to do a game of the week, for example, and it had been in all the papers about how Reggie and George were feuding. And so the producer wanted to get a sound bite. And Reggie told them a story. It was a terrific story. They liked the story, but it was too long. They said, we can't get this in between innings. The story goes on too long. Reggie said, don't worry about it. Second time he comes up, he looks up. I stand up. I told our guys to play it. Reggie gets up to home plate. He puts the rosin on it, gets the pine tar, fixes his spikes, and he fixes his hat, and he's looking at me. We played the whole tape, finished the tape. I sat down, which was the cue. Reggie got in the batter's box. Boom, he was ready to go. I think Reggie got up in the morning and figured out what the media wanted to hear that day. He was definitely the master of self-promotion. Reggie, the candy they named after me. Mmm. Reggie, you taste pretty good. Players really resented that self-promotion. There's no question there was a lot of resentment. Mr. October's relationships didn't improve in 79 or 80 when his 41 homers tied for the league lead. In a strike-shortened 81 season, Jackson slumped to just 15 homers over 94 games. And after the Yankees lost to the Dodgers in the World Series, the boss allowed his opinionated star's contract to expire. Jackson, at 35, was again a free agent. He was shown to the door by Steinbrenner when the contract was out. He had done his five years, and George had all sorts of uh, concepts that he was the big man on the Yankees, not Reggie. When Sports Century returns, Reggie Jackson heads west out of the glare of the New York media to heal under the California sun. George Steinbrenner in the year 2000 looks back at Reggie leaving the Yankees after his five-year contract was up as the greatest mistake he ever made. Part of the Yankees is winning, but the other part is show business, attention, drama, aura, history, legend. Reggie accomplished all of that for Steinbrenner. Nobody else has been able to do that since. Steinbrenner's decision began to haunt him on the night of Jackson's homecoming as an angel in Yankee Stadium. I was very uncomfortable that night because it was raining, it was cold, the game was pitching. And I was hitting 160 or something like that. And I had to face Gidry, he was a handful. Reggie hit an upstairs home run off of Ron Gidry as Reggie did in the big moments, and as he strutted around the bases, if you looked at a man, there was Gidry applauding his left hand into his glove uh, in, in subtle appreciation for Reggie. The crowd said, you know what the crowd said? Everybody in the ballpark turned towards Steinbrenner's box and started chanting, Steinbrenner sucks. I mean, it didn't get any better than that. The Yankees were putting their gloves in front of their faces because they just looked at him and said, you know what, he's still got it. On September 17, 1984, in Anaheim, Jackson entered the golden circle of sluggers. There it goes, home run number 500. Three years later, Jackson retired at 41. In January of 1993, 
he was voted into Cooperstown. Still, he was not beyond the reach of easy criticism. This guy uh, was a terrible outfit. He got in the Hall of Fame with a fielding average of 945, a batting average of maybe 265. I didn't like the idea of seeing him win. Sure, his batting average is in the 260s, and he struck out more than 2,500 times. Anybody would take those numbers as necessary baggage, along with hitting 563 home runs. They call it the Hall of Fame. They don't call it the Hall of Nice. They don't call it the Hall of Good. When the spotlight was on Reggie, he performed as no other baseball player has performed. Friends, in the words of Lou Gehrig, today I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. He's probably one of the last colorful players that you would pay to see. If he has a bad day, he's still exciting. And I think not many guys you can say that about. The bastard wanted to win the game. And, and whether you thought he was a hot dog and a, and a loud mouth and everything else, and if you were a Yankee fan and didn't really want him, well, go back and see how many World Series you had won in all those years before he got to town. And then go see how long it took you to win the World Series after he left town. Reggie's always going to be Reggie till he goes to his grave. And he'll probably go waving his hand. And talking, believing his every word. I've always been able to hear and read what I say before I say it. That's why I'm a good quote or a good interview. If I say something that's uncomfortable for someone's ears, it's going to be the truth. I just happen to voice it, but it's the truth. It's not my opinion. Before a game against the Texas Rangers in 1973, Reggie sat in front of his locker and spoke so softly that the attending reporter had to bend over to hear him. I'm going to be great, Jackson said. Great. When the writer tried to lighten the moment by replying that the Oakland Slugger was already pretty good, Jackson shook him off. He said, you don't understand. I want to be the greatest. For ESPN Classics Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler.